the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, Imperial citizens, to The Emperor Protects. Today, we are tackling book three in the Horus Heresy, Galaxy in Flames, and uh, I think that that is a fitting title for what we're going to cover today. With me, as always, is my co-host, Dan. How you doing, buddy? Doing great, my friend. How are you? I am doing really well. Um, it's a scorcher here in Iowa. It's miserable. Um, yeah. the, the sun is our enemy. The old gods have abandoned us, but... Yes. <laughs> We're going to make it. <laughs> I can't be in my office past two o'clock. Otherwise, it turns to an oven. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you not have any air? or? So we do, but my office window is it's on the second floor, and it's southward facing. And oh. I, it, uh, just the way it, the building is constructed, it's like I'm an ant, and there's a magnifying glass outside oh my door. <laughs> God. Oh, my God. So it's just a, it's a little inferno. But uh, we're good. We're doing good here. Uh, it's still... Lower temperatures than on Istvan, as we will soon get to, and um, <laughs> sure. things are going to be fine. So uh, for those of you who are new to the show, first of all, welcome. We're taking these first five or so episodes to go through the chronological story of the Horus Heresy through its opening books. So we started um, with the very first book. We're going, I think, as the first four are chronological, right? Because Fly the Eisenstein, Roughly, Fulgrim yeah. kind of goes back a little bit and then carries forward. Yeah, the thing that's weird, and it, we were going to comment on it, is that yeah. this book and then Fly to the Eisenstein, they're actually kind of, um, they're kind of t at the same time, a lot of the things are happening in both books. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're kind of simultaneous, even though they're separate stories. Uh, and it, and just knowing that ahead of time helps when we talk about them because then you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that guy. I remember yeah. this happening. Uh, but yeah, they're they're very um, parallel stories in terms of timeline. Do you wonder like how the authors did that? Like, because they're all they're different authors for the first four, I think three or four, or the three or four we're talking about here today. Where like. Did they all just get into a room and they do like the red string, like conspiracy theory board of like how they tied well, all this together? <laughs> you know, I've heard um, interviews with the authors mm -hmm. and I know that people ask them that question. And I think exactly what you just said, they did sit down together nice. and they did kind of work out the stories to make sure that things were consistent. Like, can I use this character? Can I use that character? Mm -hmm. And this is what I plan to do. And, you know, kind of get a sign off from the other person and, I think that's exactly what happened. Nice. Yeah. I like it. I was just kind of curious. I, I, I've never had to collaborate with a writing project in particular. Yeah. So I was like, how do you do that? Yeah. Um, but we have some cool stuff to talk about because uh, just before we get into our, our book coverage today or lore coverage, um, Horse Heresy 2, HH2, has been released to the wilds. And uh, I heard you got some stuff in the mail, Dan. Oh, man. I... I was. I saw the. I saw the package. I was like, uh, do I really want to open this thing up and then to have to start something all new? It, but then once I opened it and I saw the dark, dark uh, ages box, I mm -hmm. saw my Kratos tank. I got my. Uh, and what I reached for first was that Lieber Astartes. Man, I pulled that out. I ripped off the cover. You know the rap and it was just like, oh man, I could just sit here for hours and read through this book. <laughs> oh my god and then you know you look and it's like oh my god it's a whole new game system <laughs> yeah oh yes yeah it's like but then you know it's funny because uh, they always say you know i'm a, a little little older than than some folks who'll be listening and it's like they always say you should learn new things as you you know as you get older and it's always good to learn new things well i'm learning a whole new game system so i get that box checked you know <laughs> hmm. um, yeah, it's it's really exciting to see it, and I know I'm going to be doing white scars. Um, okay, we'll talk right about on that before the show, and I've got some interesting color schemes. I think I'm going to try to actually use dry pigments for the first time on uh, some GW models, and try to do some stuff with that. And I think I'm going to hold out about ten of my uh, Marines out of the the big box just to experiment with that because I yeah. really haven't used them much before. Uh, the only time I've used them was I used to be a model railroader and I used to use them to age all my rolling stock a lot. Oh, okay. Uh, and so I've got four or five different ones. They're from uh, secret weapon miniatures. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they have a really nice collection and so yeah that's that's kind of my plan is to get those out and experiment and try those and then boom get the other 30 done <laughs> it's that's terrific yeah very exciting yeah, for me, um, for those of you who are, are following along, I'm, I'm doing a lot of content on it over on 2 Plus Stuff. It's in the description below if you need it. But uh, I'm doing the Sons of Horus for a myriad of reasons. Um, but the biggest one is I, I, I really want to try painting that nice kind of like phthalo green that they have going on. I, if you if you use oil paints, that's what they typically call it. But uh, I want to try that, and I'm going to do the i'm going to kind of theme them based on the battle that we're going to cover today in today's book because after <laughs> rereading it i was like oh, this this is banging on all cylinders um where i want to have them either be like the survivors or the attackers of the sons of horus so lots of weathering because they've been sitting there fighting for a month yep um all kinds of stuff so as we go through today's story keep in mind all these things are going to hopefully be on doug's models <laughs> as we talk okay. about the ridiculous damage um so that's yeah that's awesome so we'll keep you posted on those if you want to follow along uh, with me like i said two plus stuff i'm going to be doing content all about my army and and that kind of thing so um but let's uh let's let's move in so normally uh, we're in the future once we get past these initial books we're going to be going topic by topic where we will basically state our sources where, what books you can find this information from obviously for right now we're working out of a single book so galaxy in flames by is it ben counter is that his name yes it yes is okay yeah. make sure I, I i was just had that moment of like i'm too confident in my answer so i had to second guess <laughs> myself right right um and we're gonna be hopping into that one thing i do want to throw up before dan takes us away with his wonderful synopsis is this is a book that has a myriad of characters and stories we cannot cover them all <laughs> in minutia we'll be here for five hours um instead some of the characters that are introduced they talk about them like you already know them that's because you're going to learn their story in fly of the eisenstein and fulgrim mm. and so all three of those books uh this book and those two work together in tandem to give you three perspectives that are happening simultaneously mm -hmm. and so i'm cool with like leaving some details out of of those and the relationships between some of those and then we can just focus on what the main events are because to me, this is the story of the Sons of Horus plus other characters because it's from Loken's perspective. Sure. Um, but yeah. yeah, I just want to throw that out there. There's a lot of subplots. There's a whole Titan crew that has an internal heresy, like all these crazy things. Yes. We're going to stay mission focused. Um, yeah. Unlike yeah. the chaos traders. And so we're going to, we're going <laughs> to nail this. <laughs> story forward. All right. Uh, so take it away, man. Talk talk to us about some Galaxy in Flames. So what we have is, you know, in the last, in our last episode, yeah. <laughs> uh, Horus got his wound from the Anathema and it appears to be fully healed. Yep. And he looks like he is ready to continue the Great Crusade. Mm -hmm. But in reality, he is counseling with the Dark Gods now. We know that he is literally communing with them. And he's ready to execute his opening moves in the campaign to overthrow the emperor. But one piece of unfinished business we have here is he has to purge the traitor legions, of which there are four now, including his, of any remaining loyalists. And mm -hmm. he has a plan to do this. He's, you know, one of the things I, I find fascinating with Horus, people think, oh, now he's just this crazy dude, you know, because he's chaos. But he is like, he is the ultimate plate spinner. I mean, he's got like yeah. 10 things he's got planned all going on at the same time. He is just an absolute, not only tactical, but strategic genius. And mm. this is just one of those pieces, one of those plates that he's got spinning right now is the stuff going on in Istvan. So um, the first part of the book, interestingly enough, is called Long Knives, which I believe is a historical reference to something that happened in Nazi Germany during the 1930s where uh, – Hitler basically purged the Nazi party and mm -hmm. killed people who were loyal to him and others who he just felt were not uh, useful going forward. And it was called the Night of the Long Knives. And mm. so this is very, obviously, very similar to what happened then. Um, so Horace gathers three of his brother Primarchs. And so Angron, Fulgrim, and Mortarion 
Yep. So World Eaters, Emperor's Children, and Death Guard have all bought in. They are ready. And yes. they have decided that they're going to begin their moves in the Istvan system. And they're going to justify this uh, move by crushing a rebellion that's going on in the system, which, interestingly enough, has been going on for almost six years. So it's been going on for a really long time. Yep. But conveniently, they can use this to uh, uh, kind of justify getting their their fleets to this place and assembling everybody. Yes, and I want to point out, I love the fact that, like, three characters from various legions were all just like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Why are you bringing three legions to take one planet? <laughs> and like, it wasn't making any sense. <laughs> right. It, yeah. It didn't take a genius to figure that out. It was, it was good. That is true. Yeah. And they're all like, just nuke it. <laughs> like everyone, everyone has the same thing that like, when you try to explain Warhammer 40,000 and why people fight with chain swords instead of just nuking it from orbit, <laughs> they all have that exact same thought. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yep. Oh gosh. So, uh, while they're assembling their fleets, uh, Horus meets with the chief astropath on the Vengeful Spirit. Her name is Ingmay Singh. Mm -hmm. And she starts asking her questions about Ifriti Keeler, who is now unofficially called the Saint because of some things she did in the last book, right? And she has become uh, a very central figure in this new cult centered around this document called the Lecticio Divinitatis that we talked about last time, yep. um, which basically this cult worships the emperor as a god, which mm -hmm. is exactly the opposite of what he wants with the imperial <laughs> truth. And uh, she has kind of converted to this based on her uh, experiences and the fact that she actually manifested some psychic powers that destroyed a demon. So yes. that's really what kind of elevated her to this status that she's at now and ever since she did that she's actually been in a coma and she's been unconscious and if you remember carol cinderman was a iterator which is kind of like a priest for the imperial truth mm -hmm. well again based on all his experiences he's had over the last two books he's now the chief order for the new religion he has been converted yes and he is now a true believer in her and in her beliefs um so Singh is having this conversation with Horus, and Singh realizes what's happening here. So she sends a psychic message to Cinderman, warning him that Horus is going to destroy Killer, which makes perfect sense, Doug, because mm -hmm. he knows that she is a threat to his patrons now. She yes. is going, she can destroy demons. I mean, my, my gosh, you know, anti chaos. And, uh, not knowing, he gets this message, and not knowing who he should trust, he actually meets with the moderate of the Dis Ire, which was a warhound type we talked about before. Um, and the two moderate are kind of like the two co-pilots, I guess is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. uh, their names are Kassar and Arakan. And he asks for their help to help St. Keeler, because she is obviously in peril now. So the interesting thing, I don't know what you thought about this. I thought it was great, actually, was so yeah. Horace realizes that she's done this. Absolutely. And Absolutely. He, yeah. he kills her not just by killing her, but he actually uses her as like a conduit, as a sacrifice, so that he can commune with the dark gods. So he literally, at least the way I saw it, kind of let demons possess her so that he can have, you know, kind of like using her as a... Uh, a pay for go cell phone, you know, Hey, okay. Yep. I need to, to make this phone call. It was just, it was so dark. Oh I, you know, um, just throwing forward a little bit. That's actually a concept that's, it's brought back a lot in the betrayal at Kelth mm. when word bearers shut down communications a lot of times, but they like communicate by making people like go through extreme torture and they kind of use the warp, uh, to communicate with each other. So they have walkie talkies yeah. and ultramarines don't. And yeah. it, I, did, I totally forgot that, like, yeah, this scene is in there because he sacrifices a psyker to have a communion. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't this, realize it went back that far. <laughs> well, yeah, and this is also, you know, one of our both our favorite books is First Heretic, when they actually use uh, astropaths for another purpose that we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the same kind of mechanic. But, it, yeah, they, that was just such a 
chilling scene when he did that to her. So, and uh, I just want to add one more thing in there. I like the fact that because the that first section of the book doesn't have a whole lot of you know space marine battle action, mm-hmm. we see Horace treating Cinderman and, and Keeler as if they are an equal threat to something on the field. Like he needs to deal with this. And I like that because it's kind of like um, you, you might have mentioned to to World War II with the Germans and the Nazi Party and stuff like that. They treat these characters who have no physical might whatsoever like a thought virus in the same way that Nazi Germany treated communism. Like oh, mm-hmm. when they when they released um, – I'm terrible at history names. I'm so sorry. What's his name? Uh, communist leader Lenin from prison and kind of dropped him back in Russia. It's like here's a thought bomb. <laughs> Yeah. And it's going to yep. destabilize everything. That's how Horace is approaching these because it, sh- I mean, if the Imperial truth falls apart, he's still building on that foundation of there's, you know what I mean? Like he, yes, he needs them. And if everyone's afraid and disagrees with stuff, it gets real messy for him and his plan. So I like the sure. fact that he treated them with such seriousness. Yeah. Agreed. That That's a great point. It is. Uh, and so, uh, Cinderman collects these two guys and they, you know, rush to St. Keeler because obviously Horace has got something in plan. And so we find Maggard and you might remember this guy is just a total jerk, man. He was, he was Mm -hmm. the bodyguard originally of Horace's biographer and killed her. And he basically is just an enforcer now for Horace and for Malagurst who is Horace's equity. And he has been gene enhanced. He's, He's about as close to a space marine as you can be, I mean, as a human. And so he attacks them, and, I mean, he's going to kill them. They're just civilians, right? (laughs) So all of a sudden, this this threat seems to awaken Keeler, and she comes out of her coma, and she uses her powers to not only paralyze him, but it's almost like a movie moment where you can see she stops the bullets that he fires at them. And they're just like slowly moving through the air. And you go, oh, that is so cool. It's like a, a Matrix moment kind of thing, you know, yep, yep. Um, which is really cool. So they grab Keeler. They get her out of there and they take her into the lower decks because these spaceships obviously are miles long. So they can lose themselves in the um, in yeah. the, the vastness of the ship. So they do save her. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that is going on. And I think that's an important piece because it does bring in these you know as we try to filter through all the stories as you talked about like why is the crew of this titan important well they saved keeler that is huge i mean Mm -hmm. imagine if she had died all the things we wouldn't have in the stories so that's a really important event i think in this uh, in this part of the story so uh while all that's happening the opening battles in the Istvan system, because it is a system and has several planets. Yeah. Uh, so they have sent the Death Guard and the Emperor's children to assault a station on Istvan Extremis. It's one of the planets. And this is where we meet one of my very favorite characters mm-hmm. in the, uh, Heresy, which is Nathaniel Garrow. He is the captain, I believe, of the seventh company of the Death Guard. So he is Death Guard. He is a much Mortarian guy. And Saul Tarvitz and Eidolon, also from the Emperor's Children, are part of this assault. Yes. Um, now, they make pretty good progress, and all of a sudden they run into something called a war singer. And it has some kind of sonic sound based weapons that it's using. And as part of the assault, it attacks Garo and very severely wounds him. In fact, he loses a leg mm-hmm. to this and ends up for the rest of the heresy having a an augmentic uh, leg. And uh, the weird thing is, so Garrett gets wounded, but Eidolon, like, <laughs> there, I, I don't I don't know, but as I was listening, you could almost just see everybody stop. Eidolon basically opens his mouth and just like, boom, he throws back this sonic force at the war singer and kills it. <laughs> yes. You, you're going like, <laughs> What? Like, when, when did that happen? Like, <laughs> did, do all the Emperor's children have this? Tarvitz doesn't have this. It, it was just so bizarre and so random at the time. And oh, it, it was really pretty cool, though, that, that he yep. could do that. 
I, I love that this book came out before Fulgrim, where that is explained. Because I, you read it, and it's like his jaw descends, and this like unearthly howl comes out. And I'm reading, I'm like, what the hell is going on? And the first thing Saul says, is, what the hell was that? <laughs> like, exactly. I never felt so on the same page as another character, a fictional character. But um, I also got the mental image of like, have you ever seen like a child scream? And then there was a video on YouTube where a parent not in a violent way, but just like raises their voice ah, and like pretends to scream back at them to, sh- to kind of get their attention. And <laughs> it was exactly what war singers like, Arr! and then Eidolon just spits it right back. <laughs> it was really cool. Actually very cool. So Garen's take, Garrow's taken to the apothecary and obviously to heal his wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and what this does is it leads the leadership of the death guard to take him off the front line. And, they place him and another Death Guard captain in a joint command of a frigate named the Eisenstein. A frigate because, you know, it's it's not too big. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, kind of an insignificant size vessel. But so these two Death Guard captains are now in command of the Eisenstein. This is obviously very important. And Let's put a pin in that. <laughs> yeah. And, and this goes to our earlier comment, Doug, that the events that are going to be happening now in the Eisenstein are concurrent with things that happen in uh, the galaxy in flames. So Mm -hmm. pretty important. So after the battle, we kind of put Gero to the side and Tarvis just kind of walks up to Eidolon and says, what is this? What what happened? (laughs) And Eidolon's like some like little kid. He's like, let me show you. Let me show you. I want to show you what I got. I want to show you where this came from. This is so awesome. So he takes him to meet the Emperor's Children Chief Apothecary, who is another infamous character in the heresy and beyond in the 40K, mm-hmm. called Fabius Bile. You know, Bile loves to, quote, augment space marines. Yeah. That, that is like his hobby. He loves doing that. And uh, so Tarvitz is showing a lot of different enhancements, not just the thing that, you know, he did that Bile did to Eidolon, but a lot of other surgical modifications that he's doing to other Astartes and the Emperor's children. And Tarvitz is absolutely shocked and disgusted by this. This is Mm -hmm. just beyond anything he has ever seen. And inside, that's how he's feeling. But Bile and Eidolon are like, hey, look, there's this new thing happening in the Legion. If you want to be part of this, we know that you're well-respected. We know that you're an important uh, leader and we would like to, you know, hey, join the club, man. We can yep. get you gifts. And now it comes out. He's just like, you guys are freaking crazy. I'm out of here. I want nothing to do with this. Mm-hmm. And I can kind of picture the two of them looking at each other like, okay, we need to let Fulger know he's yep. he's not a player. Exactly. Yeah. And I like that because now that they're in the Istvan system, like, there's no pretense. It's like, this is what we're doing. Are you on board? Pass, fail, question. Okay. Exactly, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and the way that that chapter or that scene ended, rather, I liked where Saul said, like, he knew he had been tested, but he didn't know if he had won. It's like, well, of course, mm. he chose correctly. He also chose wrong, you know, it, given the circumstances of he chose to be a, a loyalist, a good guy. <laughs> In the yeah, it's surrounded by unknown to him at the time, surrounded by traitors. Yep, yep. Uh, so that goes on, and uh, while all that stuff is happening with Garon Tarvitz and stuff, Horus and the other Primarchs they planned an assault on Istvan Three, uh, the capital city there, mm-hmm. and it's called I think it's called the Coral City. I think that's the name of it. Yes. Yep. Uh, so the assault force is to be composed of companies whose captain and legionnaires are considered to have remained loyal to the emperor. Mm -hmm. So this is very specific tasking here. They're not just taking the first, second and third companies or whatever else. It's like those companies in particular, we know, for example, at the time, at least that Loken and Torgonon from sons of Horus and Lucius, who again, will be a character forever in the, uh, you know, 30, 40 K universe. Uh, he is an emperor's children and he's actually the equity to Fulgrim at the time. Uh, those three will, their companies are going to be included in this, 
assault mm-hmm. because they're all considered to still be loyalists. Yep. Um, one of the things, there's two things that I think are interesting about how this was planned. First of all, this again gets to the tactical genius of Horace. He he cuts, once the, the loyalists get to the planet, he cuts all surface comms with the fleet so they can't communicate with anybody. The other thing that I think is really important, but it's a small detail at the time. Mm-hmm. So typically, space marines, when they assault the planet, they go down in stormbirds. Yes. In this case, he uses drop pods. He orders drop pods to be used. Now, why would he do that? For obvious reasons, he doesn't want them coming back. This is like a one-way assignment, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So. If they had stormbirds, they could get back. And I just thought that was a really cool thing that you had to kind of think about. Or you, if you didn't think about it, now that you know, you're going, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and so I like the idea of them using drop pods because they had some, like, vague tactical reason. This is, why, this is why the War Master wants us to use drop pods or whatever. And Loken's yeah. like, that doesn't make sense, but all right, whatever. Right. I guess my thought was more like if you're just going to shoot him in the drop pods, just drop pod launch him into the sun. Like, why are we wasting all this time? <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah. yeah. Just shoot him out into space. Yeah, just like, like get, get rid of him. Just brush your hands and be like, well, we got rid of those losers. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so so that's something that happens. And then, uh, so the other thing that happens is Tarvitz is really suspicious now. Yeah. Because he sees who's going to the planet, he sees who's been assigned, and he knows something is up, right? And Sol Tarvitz is such a great character. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. He, to me, is like the central guy here, because he's just... Uh, I, I loved him as a character. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you notice I used the past tense. So anyway, uh, <laughs> in part two, called The Coral City, uh, Tarvitz kind of works his way with the leadership and says, you know, during this assault, I need to stay on board the ship. I need to kind of help my fellow Marines coordinate, do all these things. So he uses his time to tour some of the gun decks and he sees these really very volatile virus bombs being loaded into the ship's weapons. And he's going, no, wait a minute. Why would they be loading virus bombs, Mm -hmm. which are used to destroy a planet? into these guns. Like, so he now knows for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that this is an act of treason. Yes. And he immediately heads to the hangar deck, steals the Thunderhawk, and boom, he is on his way to get to the, the Astartes on the planet and warn them what's coming. Um, the chase, scene, so he's, he's going down there, and the traitors see this, and they send aircraft after him to try to shoot him down. And I thought this scene was really cool. The, the whole yeah. chase scene was just so cool <laughs> with him uh, trying to evade the traitors and stuff. And interestingly enough, his mm. flight path carries him past the Eisenstein, which we just talked about. Yep. And it turns out that Garrow and Tarbitz are old friends, that they have uh, fought in the practice cages before and they know each other very, very well. And so they make contact and Tarbitz tells Garrow of his suspicions. Garrow has the same thoughts. So he's like, I'm in, I agree. Yep. So interest. So what Garrow does is really cool. So as he shoots down the pursuers, what happens is the debris field that he creates, creates kind of a radar. It's almost like he's created chaff so that mm-hmm. they can't pick up Tarvitz's ship as it goes down. But Garrow reports Tarvitz is killed. And, um, then he prepares the Eisenstein for warp jump, but he's not leaving yet. It's okay. Hang on. He's not leaving yet. Uh, but uh, that's kind of where we are in that point. What are your thoughts up to that point? So this, uh, I, I like this scene um, mainly because when you see, when we follow Saul Tarvitz, have the realization of what's happening. And, and mm. it, it might seem like um, it all happens very, very fast, but there's a few things to keep in mind of like, it would be like if. Um, America launched a nuclear strike tomorrow. Like, well, every American who thinks about it with any level of thought knows one person controls that button. It's the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. So they all know that the virus bombs, you need war master's permission to do that. So Mm -hmm. however this is panning out, Horace is involved. And so it's not good. 
Um, so like that immediate, the, the logical jump I thought was made perfect sense. The, the part that got me when I was reading this book or, or listening to it rather was the time it takes for Saul to convince Garo that there's treachery and, and on the scale. I was like, that's a little bit fast to absorb that information. Um, but then I, you know, you have to remember that both of these characters individually have their own stories of growing suspicion about the changing of their respective legions. Yes. We're following the sons of Horus mostly, but emperor's children have their own turn. So do the death guard. So I was like, you got to have some grace, little suspension of disbelief. I'm just, yes. I'm just trying to imagine like if you called me up on Skype one day and we're like, Hey, listen. Uh, so Biden's trying to destroy the entire country and spread it in, you know, split it in twain, and he just launched nukes at ten countries. I'd be like, okay, Dan, let's go fight. Get your pitchfork. You know, like, yeah. how on board could you be with such limited information? <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's a really important thing. I think you said is that we have to understand that Garrow has been seeing his own things on his own ships and on yes. the Eisenstein this whole time. He's had conversations with Mortarian. And he just knows something's happening for the same reasons, but we just haven't seen that yet. That's a really yes. good point. It, it was unexpected, but not unforeseen in the sense of all every loyalist space marine has the sense of like things are changing, but they didn't know how bad things had gotten. Yep. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's just what little note you have to slip in there to your brain to make that conversation go down smoother. It's kind of like, and it's kind of like the, when you have this secret that you want to tell somebody and what you do is <laughs> such a relief. It's like they both, you could just feel them going, Oh, finally somebody else who believes me. You know? <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> so, all right. So at this point, it's three is under attack by the elements of the four Astartes legions. We talked about the ones who are basically loyal to the emperor yep. and each one of them kind of had their own thing. So, the sons of Horus are very scattered. They came down in kind of different areas, and they're really struggling to take the Siren Hold, which I think is the palace. It's the main building inside of the Coral City. Um, or no, they weren't in the palace. They were doing the Siren Hold. That's a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So the Emperor's children uh, were led by Lucius, and they attacked the governor's palace. They killed the governor, uh, and they complete their part of the mission. The World Eaters are led by a guy named Captain Erlen, and they are making really great progress until they just become world leaders. And <laughs> they just start massacring all these traitor fanatics, and they're just, they don't care about whatever their objective was. They're just killing and tearing up, and yeah, just yeah. just being uh, Angron's boys. That's just kind of the way it is. So that kind of slows them down. And mm -hmm. then the Death Guard, being the Death Guard, they assault the trench works that are there. And so they're all kind of doing their own thing. Yep. So Tarvitz makes it to the city and he starts warning the assault forces and he meets up with Lucius. And he is decided that he's going to warn the world leaders and the emperor's children. And he wants Lucius to go warn the sons of Horus and the death guard. So the warning gets out to the emperor's children and the sons of Horus. They, they make it. They actually shelter beneath the palace, which they've taken at this point. Most of the world leaders in the Death Guard don't make it in time. So what they try to do is there's bunkers, obviously, around all over the place. There's mm -hmm. bomb shelters and things. These are all kind of sealed where they can, you know, shut them off from the atmosphere. And they, several of them, many of them do make it, but not a whole lot, really, when you talk about the total force here. Of course. So they virus bomb the planet, which basically kills all organic life on the planet. Just destroyed everything. Billions mm -hmm. of people. Billions with a B. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just, you have to wonder, like, what the faces of those four traitor Primarchs were like when this was happened. They knew they were killing 12 billion people. They probably didn't even flinch. They didn't smile. They just had these straight faces, mm -hmm. knowing they had condemned, like, twice the population of the Earth to death. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this kind of brings up a, a thing that I saw in it was a it was a more recent Siege of Terra book, but this idea of like the Primarchs they're not they're not human like yeah. in any way they're they are manufactured and so they don't there's that level of empathy that I think is very much missing in a lot of them. Um, 
Particularly these four, because they're not like the nicest. <laughs> Fulgrim, Mortarian, and Angron are not what you would call like level headed dudes. Oh. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, you're right. I'm I'm fairly certain they were unfazed. <laughs> yeah. And they said at least was what I heard is that the the psychic death screen was basically heard by astropaths just billions of miles away, everywhere throughout the Imperium. Yeah, dude. This was heard. Um so when we finish with everything here, virus bombing, it turns out, wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I do want to touch on, there's two parts to the way oh. the virus bomb works. Yes, the first one is that it is a self-replicating, but also self-devouring virus. Like, they drop it on the planet, and it eats every piece of organic matter, and then when there's nothing else to eat, it eats itself. Mm. So, like, if you can just stay disconnected from it or separated from the virus long enough, you can outlast it. It'll die pretty mm -hmm. quick. And then the second thing is that once all those gases from that decomposition have been released, they fire a nuke and the whole thing evaporates essentially. And so just, they just firebomb the whole planet after the virus. It just, yep. it is not, he's just like, Hey, do it. Yes, I know. I know. Okay. I just want to point that because like there's two waves because you see like one round of the story has like the virus bombs coming and then, there, and then Saul Tarvitz is like, okay, wait for it wait for it and everyone's just like for what? and then the whole earth explodes <laughs> so after all of this there's actually only a few hundred loyalists left there's but here's the thing that's funny is that horus was not expecting that to happen he was expecting them all to die mm -hmm. and so we're gonna we're gonna kind of segue to a couple of other things that are happening at the same time but it's important to realize that he was pissed Yes, that they didn't all die. That he had to actually do more work, you know. Uh, so, with that going on, we're going to segue to the Dis Ire, which is this Titan we've talked about, because it was assigned to support the Death Guard on the planet. And the the Princeps uh, Turnet has chosen to be loyal to Horus. He has made that choice. He's been warned of the virus bombing. And he orders his Titan power down and sealed so they can ride out the bombing and the firestorm and everything else. Yep. So we have a board, essentially. We have Turnet, the Princeps, and then we have the two Moderati, Arakan and Kassar, who we talked about helping save Keeler. Well, Kassar realizes what's happened. Like, how would he know to do that to seal up unless he knew this was coming? Yeah. So Kassar smart guy. So he turns and he tries to kill Ternay. Well, Arik and the other guy, interestingly enough, knows that Kassar has actually kind of become a follower of Keeler. And that means that he doesn't believe, they don't believe the same way. You know, Arik still seems very much to be a um, imperial truth guy, you know? And the fact that he's, his friend has kind of converted to this religion, at least that's what his perception is. He ends up killing his friend and saving Ternay. Yep. Now, the reason I think Doug, that this is an important scene is because if you realize that if they hadn't turned, the loyalists who had left would have had a Titan fighting with them. Yeah. <laughs> that's really important to know. Yep. Uh, um, I also, I like this story. I mean, we, we didn't go into too much detail because no, no, no. we just can't, but, um, I, I like it because it is a micro of the heresy. Like it's just three dudes in the cockpit of a Titan. I mean, like, relevant characters. I'm sure there were other yeah. staff and stuff, yeah. Oh sure. but it's this microcosm of like the same thing is happening outside the Titan on the scale of millions of people. But yeah. when you have these like three characters, it's like, you know, what's that old adage? Like the one person's a tragedy, a million's a statistic kind of a thing. Right. So I, I like that they included it for that reason. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that went on, and, and so now they have, they still have a Titan, the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so Keeler now, as this has all happened, has a vision. And she's seen these billions of lives taken. And she psychically warns Sinderman and Olaton, Mercedes Olaton, remember, was kind of Loken's kind of therapist, you know, kind of his counselor who he always went to to kind of unleash his thoughts and kind of, you know, relax yeah. with her. 
So um, they're now both, uh, so you have these three remembrances who are all aware of the betrayal. And at the same time, basically, Horus orders, strangely enough, all the remembrances, remembrancers in the fleet to assemble aboard the flagship. He wants them all to come. He has something to tell them. Yeah, we're going to have a potluck. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, hey, it's great. <laughs> we're going to have food and everything and uh, just some general fellowship. It's great. Um, first thing he does is he shows them what's going on. He shows them the massacre. Yep. Uh, and <laughs> obviously, you can imagine the, the reaction of these people standing there watching this. And <laughs> then he very casually, looking at their reactions... Of course, interesting that the remembrances didn't notice all the space marines that were circling them inside the compartment. He orders them, he's just like, kill them all. Yes. And yep. just starts to massacre. And there's <laughs> hundreds of these remembrances. I know, I know. It's so amazing to laugh oh. at, but it was just like, what did, you, what did you think? Like, he gets them all together for a party, and then like... I don't know. It's like if you were invited to a friend's house for a party and they put on whatever the most depressing movie you can think of as, you know, like we're going to watch Schindler's List today and everyone's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> the whole the whole air gets sucked out of the room right. in no time. And all of a sudden you see their boxcars outside the, the house. Exactly, they're yeah. like, oh, OK, uh oh, Boy, something's going on. So this all happens and you can imagine the chaos and everybody trying to run. And so Keeler, Cinnamon and all of a sudden they escape. And Keeler leads them to, again, another great character in these books, a minor character, but a great one. His name is Iacton Cruz, and he is a captain of the third company of the Luna Wolves. It's important to know because at least what I'm feeling here is that all of the, of the Sons of Horus who stay loyal, they kind of revert to their old name. They call mm -hmm. themselves Luna Wolves, you know, and Cruz is like that. Now, Cruz is a guy who's been around for a long time as a space marine. He is just, you can imagine, he's just this crotchety old guy who just has his own opinions and he's really obnoxious, but he has stayed loyal. Yep. And uh, he is actually important in some other parts of the heresy as he continues on. Uh, and the reason he's important in this story and critical is that Cruz is has seen what's happened understands what's happened he hasn't seen it but he understands what's happened he knows he has to get these remembrances off the ship he has to save them yep. and so he rushes to the hangar deck commandeers the thunderhawk but oh my god i wish this guy would just go away from the story so maggard is there the guy who's been <laughs> sent to kill them right mm -hmm. and so Cruz is a stardis we know this but as we mentioned before maggard is gene enhanced so the fight is very even between the two of them as Cruz is defending the Remembrancers. To break the deadlock, Cinderman actually picks up Magard's weapon that he had dropped. And this is just enough to give Cruz the edge to kill this piece of crap. This guy is just, <laughs> I was just so glad to see him die. He was just obnoxious. Oh, man. Although, you know, when you picture him, like I always picture him as an ogren kind of a guy almost. Oh, really? You know, it's this big abhuman, just giant, uh, dull-witted <laughs> guy. Anyway, he's dead, which is good news. And Keeler, which is, I think that she actually senses Garrow. I think she senses who he is and what he is and where he is. And so as they get the Thunderhawk fired up and going, she tells Cruz to head for the Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. And when they get there, they meet Garo for the first time, or he meets them for the first time. So it's the first time he's ever met Keeler and Cinderman and Olaton. And there will be many stories ahead yes. with, with these folks, including the next book. But um, this is where they all get together. And it's kind of where we don't hear about them much anymore. So we're going to mm -hmm. you know, continue to the next book, continue to book four to hear, find out more kind of a I, thing. I will say I was really glad that their part of the story was over. I was getting a little tired of mm. Keeler because, you know, at the end of the day, she's a photographer, okay? <laughs> true. And so the, true. the platitudes that she spouts when she's awake and it's like, you still do not trust me. At least that was the voice that the, the voice actor did for when he read the audiobook version. And I was just like, you smug little turd. You have been asleep for three <laughs> books 
And when you wake up, you do MacGuffin stuff. Don't act like you know what's going on. <laughs> and I'm reading this I'm like, I'm so sick of her. I know she's yeah, important. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree, man. Good. She's, yeah, she's out of the story for now. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then we go on to part three, brothers. Yeah. Um, sadness. It, it, yes. It's, it's kind of like I was so sad when Horace, you know, kind of... <sighs> when he was so noble and everything in book one, and then you saw the change, it was just sad. This is such a sad, but very action packed part of the book, uh, realizing what's going to happen here. So, uh, again, Oh, Dan, I lost your audio there. And he just has a hissy fit and he's like, okay, I'm taking some of my world eaters and we are going to destroy these guys. Of course, didn't tell Horace. He's just like, get on board. Let's go down there and destroy these people. Now, the problem with that is, is that it forced Horace to send additional Marines from the Emperor's Children Death Guard to support him. Because on his own, he wasn't going to, he didn't know that. But these yeah. guys are ready. I mean, the guys on the, on the planet. So um, one of the details, I think, of this fight that I want to talk about before we go into the specifics of what was happening was that basically that at this point, the Loyalists are commanded by four captains. They're commanded by Loken and Torganon from the Luna Wolves now. Yep. Uh, again, Tarvitz from Emperor's Children, that Erlen from the World Eaters, which is interesting. Uh, so they organize an epic defense. You know, you can think of the Alamo kind of thing. Like, they just made it last forever, given the, given the odds. It's three months they held out against three legions. That is insane. And what's important here in the big picture is by denying Horus a quick victory, um, it it gave uh, time for other elements, Gero, we're going to talk about in the next book, to warn the emperor of what was going on, warn the Terror about what was happening in the the treachery, yep. and they paid a really heavy price, and they got a pirate victory for this. That's all they got. Yeah, uh, and it was really it's just such an epic last stand kind of a story, um, which was really cool. I was not expecting this when I first read this book. And it's like, oh man, I could just keep reading this. You yeah, know? in Age of Sigmar terms, that's a minor minor loss, uh, <laughs> and the yes, winners got yes. a minor victory. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It, it, and that's the idea. Like they don't actually know if Garrow made it out because there's no right. communication between ground and stuff. They're just like, well, yeah. we told somebody. Um, we got to give him time just in case. Like, yeah. Oh, wow. right. <laughs> yeah. And Tarvitz again, he just comes to the fore. He is just a brilliant leader. He inspires. He moves around to help everybody. You know, defend against wave after wave of traitors. And so. The issue, though, is is it's a story of heroism, as we just talked about, but it's also a story of treachery still. Remember, we're talking about the Horus Heresy here. Yes. So Lucius, while, while Tarvitz is, is doing his thing, he's not even doing it. Like, he doesn't even want the attention. He just wants to get the job done and save his men's lives. But Lucius, being Lucius, gets really jealous. And he's like, well, Tarvitz is a jerk, man. I, I need to get some credit here. I need something. And so he kills a loyalist chaplain takes his comm unit and contacts Eidolon. And you're like, oh my God, man. Now I just want to, I want to see Lucius die. I just, <laughs> at this point. So he basically sells out the loyal to loyalists, tells Eidolon where everybody was, etc., And he kind of makes a deal, kind of cuts a deal and says, hey, I'm giving you this. I want to join you guys because I want to join the winning team here. Yeah. And, and, and I, he, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that he, the reason he is on the planet is because he is friends, or at some point was friends with Saul Tarvitz. Yep. So they kind of lumped him in. But if you know 40K and you know Chaos Space Marines, you know Lucius. This is that same guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he's not a nice guy. <laughs> he had it in his. He had it in his gene enhanced body to be this kind of guy. Yes. Yes. So yes, yes. Lucius is about well, and when he and he is Emperor's children. I mean, he's he's about him. You know, yep. just like Fulgrim is about Fulgrim. Uh, so. While that's happening, Horus is just enraged still that this is going on. So he sends Abaddon and Axabon, little Horus, 
to finish off Lokan and Turgonon. So the Mor- Mornival is being sent to finish off the Mornival, which was kind of sad, too, when you think about what that was originally. Um, Eidolon leads an attack into the palace, and <laughs> this, again, is so Eidolon, man. So he finds a group of wounded loyalists, you know, that are being kind of helped by the apothecarians. He just massacres them. Then he yep. think twice. Nope. It's done. You're loyalists. I don't care if you're wounded. To heck with you. You're gone. Um, so I, I did appreciate the scene here because uh, it's kind of in this general section of like when Angron first comes off the ship. Oh, At the time, Tarvitz is hanging out with the World Eaters, and they see something coming. The World Eaters are like, "Get out of here!" And he's like, "No, no, I'll fight with you. We're honorable, better brothers. You know, we're both uh, loyalists." And the World Eater guys is like, "No, no, 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 no. You don't understand." And then, like in the background, it's like Angron just takes out a building. <laughs> he That's... just comes at him like a semi, and Tarvitz is like, "You know what? You got a good point. I'm gonna go." <laughs> That's the Captain Erlon guy that was with him. Yeah. yeah. And he, yeah, that, that is a great point. You've never seen our Primarch fight. We have. You should excuse yourself, sir. And this was before he was a demon Primarch. I know. I know. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so Tarvitz, again, very tactically aware, knowing what's going on. He sees that Eidolon's overextended himself, and he actually organizes defenders to push back the assault again. So they're holding out still. And as he's moving around, he finds Lucius. But he sees him and he's surrounded by like this pile of dead loyalists. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, no, no way. And he's like, yep. (laughs) And we know that Lucius, interesting, I think, Doug, in this story, that all of the traitors are so much better at close combat than the loyalists. Like, I know. when did that happen? I, yep. I don't get it. Yep. Uh, so, he, but he knows that uh, Lucius is a better swordsman. He just knows it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he uses a trick that Loken taught. Remember we talked about them fighting in the cages, right? And uh, he actually, like... Um, Cold cocks him in the face. Yeah, yeah he punches <laughs> He drops his weapon and just punches him. And Lucius is like, what? We can use our hands? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, which that's is against great. the rules. <laughs> and, um, just at that point where he knocks him off balance, a bunch of loyalists arrive, and Lucius is able to escape because he knows he's outclassed now. He, even he can't dodge bullets. So uh, that that combat kind of ends. Um. And then Loken and Torgadon have figured out that Abaddon and Little Horus Axamond are there. Uh, on the way there, interesting confrontation. And I, I wanted to mention this. You know, we talked about filtering here, but there's a very important character who Loken runs into, and it is Karn from the World Eaters. Yes. First time that I can remember that we heard about Karn. Uh, we uh, met him on the bridge in the first section, but oh, this is the first yes. book, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, Karn is actually the equerry to Angron. So we got that. Um, but Loken is confronted by Karn, and they're fighting, and actually Loken was doing pretty good, honestly, considering who he was fighting. Mm-hmm. And the, <laughs> it was just like, what did you think about this scene where this tank just like tries to drive them over and it ends up impaling Karn? On, on his dozer blade. I just thought that was so bizarre. Yeah, it basically clipped his backpack, kind of like if you've ever walked past a doorknob and it hooks your belt loop or something like yep. that. Yep. <laughs> it just it just kind of yuk and keeps Come him on. going. I was like, I mean, that was, uh, you know, I, I, it sounds weird to say it's anticlimactic when it's like planetary super soldier battles, but yes. it, it was a little bit like he got picked up by a crane game machine claw and just yes. kind of moved yes. away. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, at that point, the four members of the Mournival find each other. And Loken matches up against Abaddon, and Targadon fights Little Horus. Um, as we just said, the Loyalists were outmatched. There's mm-hmm. no question about that. And Aximan ends up killing Targadon. Now, interestingly enough, a little bit later in the scene, Aximan is very... Uh, little Hor- I'm going to call him Little Horus because I think a lot of people know him by that. Yeah. Um, he he seems to have some regret, which was interesting because he normally is very taciturn and very um, 
detached from what's going on around him. He just wants to do what he wants to do. Uh, and I found that really interesting that he was uh, regretful of what he had done to Torganon. Yeah. So yep. it, neat, it was actually kind of a neat thing to see, given all the treachery and all the uh, hate that was there. So yeah. Abaddon, at this point, is outmatched Logan, is about to kill him. And here we go. Here's this here's this Warhound thing that we didn't think about, we forgot about. It actually just, as it's walking, and you understand that you know these Titans, their feet are as big as buildings. Mm-hmm. So this thing basically steps on the building as it's moving around, and the whole building just collapses on the four of them. Abaddon grabs Aximon, drags him out, uh, and Loken and Torgadon are basically left lying in the ruins is what's happening here. Um, Just crushed and, you know, destroyed. Um, So that was, this was the point where basically the back of the loyalists is broken and Horus pulls everybody out in terms of the traitors. And he orders an orbital of a bar. But to your earlier point, Doug is like, why didn't he just order that in the first place? I just kind of slipped this in there. There was a scene when uh, Horus found out that Angron had disobeyed and went down to the planet. And Erebus was like, well, fine, just nuke him too. He's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've never been on this guy's man. side. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so, uh, obviously, Horus is one, but the the sacrifice that was made was well worth it. We'll find out. Um and the, the story ends really interestingly. So you see uh, Loken buried in the destroyed building, and he's just kind of watching the firebombs come down. He's just waiting for this to, the, the inevitable to fall on him as he's laying next to targets. And, uh, yeah, so, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, and that is how it ends, a galaxy in flames. That's a fantastic like synopsis dude thank you so much for all for the sure. work, isn't it, reading that it's, so what are your thoughts like high level what do you got uh, I think it's an excellent transition mm-hmm. from knowing that the heresy is beginning to really engaging in what this is going to be yeah. and helping us understand how brutal and cruel and you know, brother against brother, this is going to be. I, I think you you kind of knew before this, Doug, but once you had this very visceral picture, you know, person by person and actor by actor being put together, you understand this is just going to be the most horrific uh, war. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and I um, I like that it ended on a, a dark note, like an Empire Strikes Back kind of a thing. I mean, this is just... <laughs> It was almost pure victory for the bad guys. I mean, it mm-hmm. had some stumbles, but um, I, I thought it was a fantastic book. Uh, this is obviously when the Harris Heresy starts, like in, mm-hmm. in in truth. I mean, everything else, it was kind of like the first two books were how we got here, but this is the start of the Heresy. And so um, yes. certainly from the, the points in time that you and I can play in with our armies and stuff like that, mm-hmm. this is this is the start and flag. Um the the various sh- stories that are woven into this this book is very dense because it is bringing in elements of Fly mm-hmm. of the Eisenstein and Fulcrum and obviously characters from the first two books. Mm-hmm. It's very dense, but I thought it was exceptionally well done. It's one of the reasons I like Ben Counters. Yes, this and uh, a few other books that he's written in particular. But uh, I think he just handles the various scenes well, and each of them contributes to the greater picture. Yes, I agree in, in a very good way. Um, I will say having, so you, did you read this book on a dead tree paper? Uh, Originally. And then I listened to it for this, this time. Okay. Yeah. So I listened to it as well. And I was thinking to myself, you know what I'm really missing because I chose audio is the dramatis personae in the beginning with everyone's names. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And I I put, saw you put at the bottom here, notable characters. And I was like, yeah, there's just between the Titan crew guys and these random people, they're meeting on the ship. And it's just like. I could have made I could have made this list like five times as long. I, know. I think just listeners, I got like maybe eight people on this list, seven or eight people, uh, and it could have been so much longer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the uh, you know the the things that are happening throughout the story. There's also shout outs 
to other stories, like he gets an update on what's happening with, uh, not Aramon, Magnus. Magnus and the mm-hmm. Space Wolves is going on right now at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, Erebus has his own plans in motion. They're talking about sending people to go hang out with Gilliman at Kalth, which mm-hmm. we now know what that means. And so uh, it's interesting. Now, w- one thing I, I felt like from this book is this makes it seem like um, Horus has sort of like a, a vague working relationship with the chaos gods mm-hmm. but then if you fast forward to like uh logar in the betrayal of Kalth, he has almost a mastery of how to use the warp oh. as a weapon and and the difference in those two even though horus is technically the war master is is dramatic um because well, when we get know, to the betrayal of Kalth, logar has this stuff on lock <laughs> well you know this is this is back to the point we talked about in the last book where you know erebus at least to me he seems to have been involved with the chaos gods much earlier than you know horus the original part of the story we hear here you know horus rising years and years before which would make sense that lorgar was so much more involved with the chaos gods because he and erebus and um we're gonna corferon who we'll learn about have all been working with them and have all you know used the chaos powers they've used the warp energies for certain things they've been doing it for a very long time before the heresy even starts yeah and so to your point horace is kind of a new, he's kind of learning how to ride the bike you know as it were mm-hmm. um and the rest of them are just kind of watching man you made it to first page you made it to, you know? <laughs> exactly yes hey yeah. go horace go <laughs> but yeah they are just masters of warp deviltry there's no doubt um yeah I, I, know, I, I like the book. It was it was awesome, um, and I'm very excited for the next one. So, Fly to the Eisenstein is my yes. favorite Horace Heresy book. So, I'm excited to get into that. Um, one thing I did want to point out is like I have never in any of Games Workshop's intellectual properties been a Slanesh fan, mm. and I'm reading this. And I'm like, I forgot that I really liked Lucius when I first started this hobby. Like, <laughs> without a whole lot of knowledge, I'm like this guy is he's Starscream from Transformers, and I love it. <laughs> And you know what's weird when you say that? I hated him throughout the Harris. I know. He's the I just worst. did. But when I read about him in the Abaddon books, like I just had this whole, totally different picture of him. He, mm-hmm. To me, he was this totally different person. You know, this is 10,000 years later, of course. But oh, yeah. he just seemed very different. He was almost like he was lighthearted. You know, and he's almost like the comic relief. He always has a funny little you know, quip to say or something else mm-hmm. in these conversations he's in with Abaddon and the others who are surrounding him. And it's like, this is not the St. Lucius that I read about in the heresy is yeah. much better version. I like this one better. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, uh, I liked him quite a bit. Um, let's see here. We'll move, cool. move on. Uh, so that was our main discussion on the book. If you have any questions about the book, please go ahead and leave it in the comments. Um, I have this video up on YouTube. Uh, sorry, I have this podcast on YouTube as a video format, as well as the various podcasting apps. Uh, we didn't have a ton of questions from last week, which I kind of expect for these book-focused ones because it's pretty succinct. You either like it or you don't, and there's not a whole lot of ambiguity. <laughs> but uh, so we'll keep on moving if you do have a question for us. Go ahead and leave it there. And um, I think we already said we're going to be doing Flight of the Eisenstein next, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I'm excited about that. Obviously, you are because your boy's in it, Garo. Oh, man. Oh, gosh. I don't know how I forgot. I forgot he lost a leg. Like, I thought I forgot it was that grievous of a wound. Like, yep. <laughs> they just prop him up on a rock on yep. Istvan. I was like, oh, wow. Um, yeah. Well, sweet. Do you have any uh, closing closing thoughts on the book that you want to share with us before no. we? No, I love what we've talked about. It just was a great transition. Benzo is a, a great author, and as you you have mentioned, I enjoy his books very much. I'm mm-hmm. very much a fan, and it was great to have him write this kind of a transitional uh, story uh, to get yeah. us really going in. And one of the things I like about Ben and also they had a, a writer who did a lot of books called Josh uh, named Josh Reynolds. I also loved all of his. Whereas the characters are intelligent, and as opposed to a lot of times in some books, you're like, "How are you not understanding what's happening?" But when you know they put the pieces together, they all make perfect sense timing wise. It does. 
the craziest conversations are when Tarvitz convinces Garo to side with him instead of the Legion. Um, but that's it. I mean, I, oh, and that's a fair jump if you've read the other books. So it's a, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, for I, sure. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Oh. I'll get this edited up and uh, out to the masses.